I saw the Lord standing by a tin wall, holding tin in his hand. The Lord said to me, What do you see in this? I said, Tin. The Lord then said, oh, I'm about to place tin among my people, Israel. I will no longer overlook their sin. Isaac's centers of worship will become desolate. Israel's holy places will be in ruins. I will ask Jeroboam's dynasty, attack Jeroboam's dynasty with the sword. Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent this message to King Jeroboam of Israel. Amos is conspiring against you in the very heart of the kingdom of Israel. The land cannot endure all his prophecies. As a matter of fact, Amos is saying this, Jeroboam will die by the sword and Israel will certainly be carried away into exile, away from its land. Amaziah then said to Amos, Leave, you visionaries. Run away to the land of Judah. Earn your living and prophesy there. Don't prophesy at Bethel any longer, for a royal temple and palace are here. Amos replied to Amaziah, I was not a prophet by profession. No, I was a herdsman who also took care of sycamore fig trees. Then the Lord took me from tending flocks and gave me this commission. Go, prophesy to my people of Israel. So now listen to the Lord's message. You say, don't prophesy against Israel. Don't preach against the family of Isaac. Therefore, this is what the Lord says. Your wife will become a prostitute in the streets and your sons and daughters will die violently. Your land will be given to others, and you will die in a foreign land. Israel will certainly be carried into exile, away from its land. Thanks be to God, Israel, the Lord. For us in the reading, a metaphor for what's commonly known as the plumb line, even though the scripture that was read this morning refers to the plumb as a piece of tin, translated either ways, most recent translations use the word plumb or plumb line. Well, what's going on here is that the king Jeroboam and the priest of Bethel, Amaziah, do not want to look forward. They do not want to understand what is out there, plain in sight in front of them. They want to hang on to the past. They want to dwell on the way things have been for a long, long time. They want to keep high places where idols are worshipped out in the hills close to the mountains. They want to maintain all those idolatrous sanctuaries within Israel. They want to maintain the house of Jeroboam, which is full of all kinds of sins and abomination, away from the holiness of God and the commandments and the laws that they have been taught. So there was great resistance toward Amos and his words to them. They were living well, let a sleeping dog lie, hold ourselves together. If you want to go prophesying, O seer, go off to the other nation, Judah, and stir up the issues there, cause the problems, but just leave us alone. So then it says to Jeroboam, your wife is going to live a life of degradation. Your children will lose their lives. The land in Israel will be carted off as into exile you will be parceled out 
and your own death will take place. As I looked through this passage, I thought about its metaphorical teaching. I thought about this cord with a plum. And if some of you have not seen a plum or know what a plum line is about, it is held up vertically next to a building or next to a wall to detect how correct it is standing within the gravity center of the earth. So here we have a plumb line, and I'll just kind of hook it around this microphone here, and hopefully it won't go slipping off and crashing down. Nope. Well, I'm not going to want to fiddle with this too much. There we go. I think we're going to be okay. So as a plumb line would be before us as people of God, let us think about this passage. When a plumb line is held up, it is vertical, it's straight, and it's meant to be a measurement placed in relation to beams and walls. In other words, it's used to guide building construction. It is not employed as a tool. Tools for construction would be a hammer, a saw, a square. It would be a tool of putting beams and lumber together. But the story indicates that after a while, like the children of Israel, what has been created can begin to lean, move out of shape, either to the left, to the right, to forward, or backward. Like any good, strong building on a foundation, what's going to take place is that there is some settling and some change that take place after time. And so we're talking about here a mid-course correction. And Amos was coming to the king and to the priest and to the people and, and saying a number of things metaphorically in relation to the plumb line. He was saying, your walls are tilted. Not only have they tilted, but they are really bent over. Now, this is because the messengers and the prophets of the past have given you plenty of warning to straighten up your lives, your act. Falling on deaf ears, and you know what happens to a building. When it tilts, after some years, it's going to tilt some more. It's going to lean, and pretty soon, well, you would love to reconstruct, but it's so far out of balance to the side, just simply Remove the foundation from the foundation and begin again. So here we have this situation where what is straight and narrow and full of wonderful guidance from messengers and prophets from God, a people who have ignored God's word and direction coming to them to the point where they were beyond repair. And God says through Jeremiah, as the plumb line, as the message, I'm never going to pass this way again. Folks, it is over. The king's wife, the children, the land, all are going to be offered into exile and into ruination. Think of the Tower of Pisa. That great huge tower that's leaned for a long time and just about 10 years ago they realized it was going to fall flat on its face and after millions of dollars of jacking it up, it's a little more straight but still leaning as it has for a long time. So I thought a little bit more metaphorically about this passage today. 
of my looking forward or the ch church looking forward, moving from where we are, listening to God's word for us day by day and week by week. And I said to myself, what's one of those places that I do the most looking forward? And so I found out that the windshield of my automobile is about six feet wide. And it's about two and a half feet high. And then when I go inside, I look at the rear view mirror, and it's about 10 inches wide, and it's about two and a half inches high. And I actually went out and measured it this morning. In doing so, I realized that the windshield is about a hundred times larger than that rear view mirror. The mirror on the car is designed to look backward, but the windshield, much larger, is for the driver to see what's ahead and what's coming. It's designed that way so the driver can have an optimal view of what's coming ahead. So it struck me in relation to this passage that a lot of people spend their lives like this king and this prophet of steering away from what's looking ahead and fixating on that little rear view, rear view mirror. Fixating on the experiences of life that's guided them for a long time, that seems to be their GPS, and so they focus on these navigational instincts. So in this story, as what can happen in the life of religious people, instead of focusing on God's mid-course correction, taking out the plumb line from time to time, <clears throat> instead of believing in what God has waiting for us in the future, beckoning toward a new future, so many, many focus on recovering the past. So the orientation map for them is really directing them backward rather than forward. And you know, that turns out to be a pretty difficult way to drive. So here we have a story of Hamaziah providing a great deal of resistance to Amos. He's digging in his heels. I'm reminded then that the story is really talking about the circumstances of these people in the Bible, metaphorically for us as well, as people fixating on that which is not moving them forward. As I thought about this passage of many, many times that we do not learn from our mistakes or from our history or the, from the voices that guide us, I thought of the phrase from Soren Kierkegaard, and I'll, re I'll paraphrase it. It simply says, life can be understood by looking backward. But if you're going to live your life, Kierkegaard says, you need to focus on moving forward. So the question is, how do we treasure or accept the past as valuable, but not get stuck in it? This seems to be the trick and the challenge. Well, I think it's important for us that we teach ourselves to call out the wisdom from the past experiences, what's happened to us, but not allow the past to dictate the future we're looking toward 
through that windshield. This is our regular assignment, to be forward-looking people. Unless we get disoriented by our backward-looking and ending up in a crash. So I'm reminded this morning in my concluding remarks of a reading that I had read myself, refreshed by Peter Marty to me. I remember that several years ago, there was a successful program in which seasoned, qualified farmers helped Iraq war veterans cope with their post-traumatic stress disorders. The farmers in the Midwest and the West did so by creating opportunities for hundreds and hundreds and thousands of veterans to live and to work on farms in the farmers' local uh, community. Now, the PTSD had been greatly challenging these veterans, causing them to not be able to focus, causing them to have all kinds of problems sleeping, and temper tantrums, and all kinds of manic outbursts. But when they came to the farm, the demands of planting, and harvesting, and digging into the soil, and being close to nature, and feeling the pulse of growth and change around them, seem to wake them up to a positive, forward-looking future. This experience of farming, planting, watering, cultivating, weeding, harvesting, selling, participating in the nature and the goodness of life moving forward, <coughs> which any gardener or farmer know, had a complete redirecting effect on these veterans. It changed their feeling, changed their vision, it brought hope and direction and peace to their lives. So beloved of God, we are about making memories and we cherish our memories. But if we focus there, we drive by looking into that little backward focused rear view mirror. This is not about changing the size of the mirror. We still need a backward mirror, but we need to focus on looking through that big windshield in front of us, what's ahead of us, now, in the story of Amos, these guys were dead set having to do with listening to the message of Amos. And you know, these guys completely failed. All that Amos predicted as the voice of God to the people, being the plumb line, did take place. Their nation ended up in ruination. ruination. They were hauled off to a foreign country. So what's ahead of us? What will <coughs> we spend the rest of our lives focusing upon? We are called people of God to be moving forward, but at the same time, letting ourselves Pay attention to that vertical line that would give us the co correct measurement for what is straight, what is correct, what a square corner would be, where the parts of the building and being put together would be accurate as we as a congregation would move forward in the constructing of our own destiny. Beloved, this is our faith. Thanks to the mercy of God. <laughs>